in empty spaces, as though caught in a spider web of wire. The piles of shoes grow. The shoes of corpses. Small shoes. Children's shoes. Men's shoes. The shoes of little girls. And that is the first stanza of a poem written by a 12-year-old girl in 1943 in the Majdanek concentration camp. And that poem really uh, encapsulates the horror of the Holocaust as though caught in a spider web of wire. Small shoes, children's shoes, men's shoes. And that was written by a 12-year-old girl who was seeing this happen while she was there. It's a primary source document of her suffering and a documentation of the maliciousness that brought this to be. People have called World War II the Good War. Ken Burns' groundbreaking documentary on the Second World War was simply called The War, as though it needed no other explanation or title. The war. The one by which all others are compared, I think is the inference behind the title. And when a single documentarian's work becomes the bastion by which most modern Americans learn military history, I think we should all take note of his phrasing on something as important as the title of his monumental work. And I don't mean to discredit Mr. Burns. He's doing a wonderful job at bringing military history to a society that is ever more turning its back on it because they find it uncomfortable. The same society that continues to choose war as the primary means by which it asserts itself politically across the globe. I could get into the political structures of postmodernism and how it approaches military history, but I think that's another video. This podcast, I'm going to bring to you another book. And this book is by the incredible German historian Gotts Alley. And it is called Into the Tunnel, The Brief Life of Mary and Samuel. And you're probably wondering who Mary and Samuel was. So I'm going to jump right into the book, the first chapter, to answer that obvious question. In 1951, the German philosopher Rudolf Schottlander proposed that the city of Berlin should designate a location where the Jewish children murdered under National Socialism might be remembered. The proposal came to nothing in both halves of the then-divided Berlin. More than 40 years later, Ingrid and Walther Seinch took up the idea. They decided to commemorate the Jewish children who had been killed by establishing a historical research award. For the name of the prize, they picked a child at random from a memorial book for deported German Jews. 
Marion Samuel. All that was known about her was the place and year of her birth, Arnswalda, 1931, and the date of her deportation from Berlin to Auschwitz, which was March 3, 1943. A detailed history published by the city provides only a slightly more extensive entry. Samuel Marion, born July 27, 1931, in Arnswalde, Brandenburg, Prenzlauer Berg, Rheinauer Strait, 11, transported March 3, 1943. Auschwitz, place of death. Auschwitz, presumed dead. At the end of November 2002, I, and this is Gotts Alley writing in the first person, which he does throughout this book. Back to the book. At the end of November 2002, I received a brief message from Walter Seinch. It read, We would like to honor you with the next year's Marion Samuel Prize. I thought, who was this Marion Samuel? I had heard the name somewhere before, and at first I vaguely supposed she might have been some Jewish intellectual of great promise who was murdered while still young. Eventually I found an article on the internet that I myself, strange as it may sound, had written in 1999. The article I specula- In the article, I speculated that, most probably on account of her age, Marion Samuel was poisoned with Zyklon B in Auschwitz immediately after her arrival. I said it was likely that her father had performed forced labor in a Berlin factory as a so-called armament Jew. As I know today, both of these speculations were correct. On that same evening in November 2002, I decided that I wanted to find out more. The award ceremony was scheduled for May 2003. I resolved that my acceptance speech should be a biographical sketch of the short life of Marion Samuel. I immediately came up against difficulties. Marion's whole family had been murdered in Auschwitz. They were ordinary, and therefore left behind few traces. I turned to old Berlin address and telephone books and archived bureaucratic records. The German Federal Archive holds a collection of the special file cards that were created for each Jewish student. Marion's card, for example, notes that she was inoculated against smallpox on June 4th, 1932, and allowed me to reconstruct her progress in school with some accuracy. At the archive, I also found the Samuel family's responses to the May 17, 1939 census. Families were required to answer the question, was or is one of the respondents' four grandparents a full Jew? Instructions for filling out this section of the questionnaire read, Racial status alone, not confessional affiliation, is definitive. For the historian, this largely intact file, with its birthplaces and birth dates, its names and addresses of family members, renders visible people who were soon to disappear almost without a trace. And that is Gott's Alley lay, laying out the genesis of his project into painting the portrait of Mary and Samuel, an ordinary girl whose name was found on a list initially and picked at random. And Gott's Alley, as I said, is an incredible historian because he uses 
pieces like that document he described, the questionnaire, the census of 17th May 1939, to piece together an incredible portrait of this ordinary and unknown child who was murdered in Auschwitz. This book is small. I've read from larger books in previous podcast episodes. But this book is incredible because within its less than 100 pages, it holds more content, more emotional empathy for the victims of the Holocaust than anything I have yet to read, and I knew I had to bring it to you. Got Sally not only Got Sally not only paints the portrait of Mary and Samuel, but he does so so completely by detailing the portraits of his closest family and their close family members. Got Sally reveals Marion's grandparents and their siblings. He reveals her parents, their siblings, who survived the Holocaust, who didn't, and how they died, what they did before the Nazis came for them, what their lives were like before the maliciousness of the Nazi party found them. Chapter 2 of the book is where Gotts Alley begins to paint the portrait of Marion's parents. And I'm going to read some selections from that here now. Marion Samuel was born on July 27, 1931, the only child of Ernst and Silly Samuel. The family lived in the town of Arnswalde in the Newmark region, in the eastern part of Brandenburg, about a hundred miles northeast of Berlin. Marion's parents, who by coincidence already shared the same last name, were married in 1929 and lived with Silly Samuel's extended family. Silly Samuel herself was born in Arnswalde in 1908. She had one sister and three brothers, of whom two, Martin and Werner, died in the Holocaust, as did her mother, Jenny Samuel. Silly's father, Carl Samuel, died before the deportations began. The third brother, the aforementioned Arthur, was able to immigrate to the United States with his wife and son in time to escape deportation. The sister, Helen, was married to a Christian and survived the war in Germany with her children. Carl and Jenny Samuel, Marion's grandparents, ran a department store in Arnswalde. W.A. Samuel Manufacturing, ready to wear shoes. The business was housed in a building at Am Mark 9, owned by the family, and could be reached by telephone at number 245. The firm had been founded by Marion's great grandfather, Wolf Abram Samuel, in the town of Verben, near Pirates, in the Pomeranian region, where he had settled. Carl and Jenny Samuel moved to Arnswalda with the business shortly after Helen's birth in 1896, and their son Arthur took over the company in 1932. It seems very likely that Ernst Samuel, Silly's husband, also worked in the store. So Silly's grandparents ran W.A. Samuel Manufacturing, excuse me, Silly's parents Marion's grandparents 
ran W.A. Samuel Manufacturing ready-to-wear shoes. And Ernst Samuel got a job there as a young man. Silly and Ernst shared the same last name. I think that's enough to bring two young people the same age looking to marry together. Maybe Silly saw Ernst working at her parents' store. Maybe he saw her. Maybe they made conversation about how they had the same last name and how some things are seemingly meant to be. It's this detail that God Sally brings us that, that makes these abstract names on a page real. And if that wasn't enough, as I said, within this small book, there's an incredible amount of content. Gotts Alley brings into the book high-resolution copies of original photographs, primary source documents. He uses Nazi bureaucratic forms that he has scanned and reproduced within the pages of the book. So you can see the documents they had to sign as they consigned away their meager possessions as they were being deported. He has a picture here beneath the reading I just shared of W.A. Samuel Manufacturing ready-to-wear shoes. You can see the name on the building across a broad courtyard. Some people are standing in the foreground because having a picture taken around the turn of the century was a big deal. It wasn't taken lightly. And it seems that it's drawn a small crowd. As I said, this book, it has a power to it that few others have. Now, Gotts Alley details the lives of Jews living in the town of Arnswalda, the birthplace of Mary and Samuel. He says that they were furs and butchers, dealers in grain, hides, leather, raw wool, and horses. They ran ironware stores and candy shops, depots for agricultural supplies, and guest houses for travelers. As he writes, we can find their names in the town records. Abraham, Abraham. Emma Mannheim. Wilhelm Arenholtz. Amadeus Menas. Benno Shops. Martha Gottfried. Sally Jachman. Frau Moses. And Frau Silberstein. God's Alley brings these people to us, and each one of them with a story as complex as the one he researched here. The depth of this comes to light reading this book, the Holocaust, and how many lives it ruined becomes apparent when you take a minute to realize each one of those names was a human as intricate as yourself with hopes and dreams, aspirations and talents. Back to the book. When change came, it came rapidly. Alfred Jachmann, an Arnswalde native whose entire family was eventually deported to Auschwitz, recalled that by 1935 a fierce, uncontrolled anti-Semitism had spread across the entire province. The wave of animosity swept up all the Jews in Arnswalda, regardless of their social standing. One of the smashed store windows, for example, was the newly installed display window of Julius Jolson, a neighbor of the Samuels who was a well-respected shopkeeper. He was 5'9 tall, strong, a stutterer a good man who had served in Field Artillery Regiment 18 in Frankfurt am Oder. Another telling case is documented in the minutes of discussion conducted in August 1935 in the office of Halsmar Schlecht, the president of the the National Reichsbank. 
According to this record, the director of the branch bank in Arnswalda had been seen shopping in the store of a Jew, who had in fact been a corporal in the war and had received the Iron Cross. Consequently, local Nazi party activists published a photograph of the director in the Nazi weekly Der Stürmer, captioned, He who does business with Jews is a traitor to the people. So it doesn't matter if you're a war hero. By 1935, two years after the Nazi party swept the elections in Germany, the routinization of barbarity had already begun. And this is after Carl and Arthur Samuel are forced to sell their small store due to the growing anti-Semitism and destruction of property. Back to the book. After the firm was closed, Carl and Arthur Samuel sold the company's building to the Municipal Savings Bank, which stood next door. The bank had the building torn down in 1935, but its foundations remained intact for more than a decade through the entire war. Part of the reason for the delay in rebuilding was a continuing debate among the city councilors about the route of a new street that would better connect the Mühlentorstrasse and former Judenstrasse Jews Road, now renamed for George Buckholzer, an early champion of the local Reformation. This idea of running a road through the space where the fam Samuel family's building had been is in accord with a later decree of Hitler's, whereby the possessions and property of Jews were to be transferred directly into community property. And that was Silly's side of the family. Now Gottsalli gets into Ernst, her father, who he has a picture of here in the book. Marion Samuel's father, Ernst, came from the town of Uekermunda in the Vorpomeran, West Pomerania region. He was born there in 1905, the son of Adolf Samuel, a businessman, and his wife, Helen. His parents kept a small shop in the main thoroughfare of the business district, which closely resembled the one in Arnswalda owned by the Silly Samuels family, and which had the largest turnover in Uckermunda before World War I. The shop was located in a modest two-story building with guttered windows that was owned by Ernst Samuels' family. Manufactured goods and clothing, warehouse, shoes... Adolf Samuel was painted in great black letters in the white background of the gable end. And God Sally has a picture of that shop in the book, right above the picture of Ernst Samuel, which was taken in 1937, again using a myriad of primary source documents to bring these, these people to light so that we can better understand exactly what happened. Back to the book. And this is this is after things start things start getting worse. This is 1938. Two years later, as in Arnswalda, the synagogue in Uckermunda was destroyed during the Kristallnacht attacks of November 9 through 10, 1938. While no documentation of the Arnswalda attacks exists, Uckermunda provides us with an eyewitness account from Annie Busk, who was working as a gardener there at the time. According to Busk, around 11 o'clock in the morning of November 10th, a middle school teacher stood with his students all of them in uniform, in front of the apothecary. On his command, the students ran across the street with stones in their hands and threw them at the display window of the Douse confectionery. I know this to be true, Busk adds, 
because I was on my way to take flowers to a silver wedding, and I heard the stones rattling over the market square. I went there and saw for myself what was happening. On the same morning, an old Jew named August Segner was forced out of his residence, possibly by the same young Volk group led by the middle school teacher. And this is in parentheses. The Deutsches Jung Volk, or German Youth, was a brand of the Hitler Youth Organization for Boys, ages 10 to 13. He was driven through the streets, and this is August Sanger, the old Jew. He was driven through the streets to the Schatzplatz, where the books and Torah scrolls from the Jewish synagogue were being burned. Sanger was ordered to read the Ten Commandments from the Torah scroll for the mob assembled there. He was shaking so much from fear, Busca remembers, that he could not read the commandments. He refused. They dragged him away. A daughter of an Ukermunda businessman named Rhine lingered to view the destruction of the plundered synagogue and was therefore late for lunch. Reportedly, her father was angry over her thoughtless curiosity. He boxed her ears for the first time in her life and said heatedly, This time, this time it is the Jews. Perhaps we Catholics are next. That response was an exception, but the way Kristallnacht unfolded in Ukermenda does indicate that it was the work of a minority. It was carried out by a group of youths led by a committed National Socialist teacher and accompanied only by a small contingent of the curious. Most citizens kept to themselves in the background and looked away, and I had marked that for a reason. An obvious reason. It was a minority of one fanatic and impressionably impressionable youth. Beginning chapter 3. Ernst and Silly Samuel left Arnswalda with their four-year-old daughter in 1935, shortly after the town's Nazi sympathizers forced the W.A. Samuel store to close and the Samuels to sell the building. The three of them moved to Berlin, where Silly's older brother Martin and his family had settled in the 1920s. The other members of the family, Silly's parents, Jenny and Carl, her brother Arthur, and perhaps also her youngest brother Werner, moved to Konigsberg, where Silly's sister Helen had already settled some years earlier with her husband. The motivations for the moves was clear. In the anonymity of a large city, the persecuted felt in less danger of attack than in the smaller, more accessible provincial communities, which offered fewer opportunities for evasion. But while anonymity at first provided protection against daily discrimination, at the time of the deportations it became a deadly disadvantage. The newly arrived lacked, as a rule, the contacts who could give timely warning to make it possible to go into hiding. And it talks here about how Ernst Samuel, who needs to make a living for his family, opened a small, a very small, cigar shop on the Rheinauer Strasse next to where the family lived. And Gott's Alley, true to his meticulous nature, lists the phone number for the shop and its, its exact address. It's just uh, the steps God's Alley takes to humanize these folks who were disappeared without a trace in 1943 that makes this book all the worthwhile and all the more powerful. Mary and Samuel, meanwhile, enters into a Jewish-only school, and God's Alley's research and meticulous nature paints a disturbing portrait of the way Jewish children were dehumanized along with their parents and segregated into separate schools. Back to the book. 
Mary and Samuel entered first grade in the neighborhood public school on April 1, 1937. The school building stood at, Stun- at Sonnbrugger Strasse 20, so Marion had to walk only about 300 yards to get there. On May 16, 1938, at the beginning of second grade, she was forced to leave that school and was enrolled instead in the third public school of the Jewish community, located at Reichstrasse 53. However, that school was already filled beyond capacity, so Marion was apparently immediately transferred to the newly established 6th Jewish Elementary School on Schorinerstrasse. And Gottsalli has a note here. The sturdy brick building of the Jewish school on Reichstrasse still stands today. The building on Schorinerstrasse was destroyed by bombing. And, and he knows this because if you read the whole book, I don't have time for the whole book, of course, in one podcast. If you want to really appreciate this incredible research and learn how to be a proper historian yourself, I suggest you buy this book. But Gott's Alley, in his meticulousness, traveled to as many of these physical places as he could as he was compiling this portrait of this family and of this little girl and that that brings it all the more all the more to the forefront of my recognition of these names on these pages as real human because God's Alley is not only using photographs and primary source documents scanned into the book such as Marion Samuel's file card from the Index of Jewish Schoolgirls, which it has underneath what I just read on the page. He went there and tied these buildings to the real world, the world in which we live today. And there I caught myself in my inevitable bias of modernity. My world is real because I'm living in it. And it's just, it's hard it's hard to see these names on the page as people like me, but God's Alley does everything he can. He pulls out all the stops in this little book to make you realize that, that they were. They were just like you. They were human, as strange as that may sound. For Mary and Samuel, and I'm going back to the book, this must have been a comparatively happy time. For many of the Jewish students whose parents had tried had tried to become assimilated Germans, this was their first experience of an environment which was not determined by the Christian majority. They celebrated the Jewish holidays with their classmates, learned about Palestine, and enjoyed a life without racial discrimination. The school was also quite progressive, even if the students did not necessarily notice that fact. It was understood, for example that students in their first year would not receive grades, but would instead be given a verbal evaluation. Overall, the Jewish schools allowed the children considerable freedom in marked contrast to the German public schools, which were run on a regimen of discipline and punishment. The students enrolled here did not think in particular that boys and girls were taught together, that there was no corporal punishment, and that they were not required to sit bolt upright with hands folded while attending to the teacher's every word. The children who had transferred from the public schools immediately sensed the difference in the rules, and their reminiscence noted how easy it was for them to fit into the new class. They no longer had the feeling of being outsiders. Rather, they were each only one Jew among any. In 1941, the Reichstrasse school building was confiscated for a German field post. From then on, the students were taught in various buildings still administered by the Jewish community. Ilse Beth Siegel, who, like Mary and Samuel, had to leave the German public school system in 1938 and enter a Jewish school, described the last months of her education. The school wandered from place to place. We studied in the Auerbach Orphanage on Schönhauser Alley. Then we were housed for a short time 
on Chorna Strasse, Strasse, and finally we wound up on Kaiserstrasse. The teachers were limited in their lessons to what was possible to teach under such circumstances. We often studied in the dark. We were told, everything can be taken from you. Only that which you have in your head is always yours. And there's Gott's Alley using a quote from an extant account of a similarly aged Jewish girl to help you understand what Mary and Samuel was going through. Finally, going back to the book, in the summer of 1942, the right to attend school was taken from the Jewish children. The official notice from the Reich's Minister for Science, Educational, Education, and National Culture read, In the view of the recent developments of Jewish settlements, the Reich Minister of the Interior, in cooperation with the Reich Association of Jews in Germany, orders the closure of all Jewish schools by June 30, 1942, and declares that from July 1, 1942 onward, the instruction, Jew, the instruction of Jewish children by paid or unpaid teachers is forbidden. Because Marion could no longer go to school and her parents had now been enlisted as forced laborers, from this point forward she was often left to care for herself. And this is where it gets into Marion's parents' life before they were sent to their deaths at Auschwitz. From April 1941, Marion's father was forced to work in the Damler Benz plant in Berlin Marienfeld, where tanks and heavy train machinery were being produced. If one inquires today at the Daimler Chrysler archives about the Jewish forced laborers, one is treated with the same courtesy and efficiency as a person wishing to buy a new car. Within seconds, I received the following information. Name, Samuel Ernest Israel. Born, November 6, 1905. Nationality, Jew. Entered, April 3, 1941. Departed, March 17, 1943. Factory number 33893. Residence, Berlin. Number 58, Rheinauer. Street 11. In the personnel book for the Man Marienfeld factory, one can see the original entry. The notation Jew appears in the space next to control number 257079. The space for occupation remains empty, while unskilled worker has been entered for the type of work. Each entry is followed by codes for the responsible social and medical insurance agencies. Ernst Samuel and his brother-in-law Martin worked in the same section as Damler. At Damler. This is the only evidence that close contact was established between Ernst and Martin's families in Berlin. Damler Benz was required to pay Jewish forced laborers according to the pay scale for unskilled labor. In principle, the Jewish worker was placed in class 1, the lowest on the salary scale, but a significantly higher income tax was subtracted from a Jewish laborer's paycheck than that of an Aryan worker. Ernst Samuel's weekly earnings were 52 Reichsmarks, but his take-home pay was only 28. The other 24 marks withheld for taxes flowed into the coffers of state and social welfare agencies. In order to estimate the extent of exploitation by the state correctly, one should know that the additional state expenditures for a worker beyond his salary were barely more than 10% of his gross pay. Although the employer did contribute to the social insurance fund, Jews were refused all health and welfare benefits. And of course, Jewish parents did not receive a child care allocation. Just how much Damler Benz itself profited from a Jewish laborer is difficult to determine. It is clear, though, 
that some 46% of a Jewish worker's salary was expropriated and used to stabilize social networks that had been undermined by the war, all for the benefit of the majority Aryan population. Forty-six percent taxes denied all benefits. Yeah, think about that. Back to the book. While Ernst was working at Damler Ben, Silly Samuel was probably a forced laborer in the delivery facility of the Blaupunkt Company, a Hedmanstrasse, her weekly take-home pay was 20 marks. What life was like in Silly's department cannot be determined in any detail. But Camilla Newman, a forced laborer in another department at Blaupunk, described her experience. Again, here's Gott's ally filling in the hole where he doesn't have Silly Samuel's exact words or experience due to lack of documentation he brings to light someone who's in a very similar situation at the same factory in a different department. And these are the words of Camilla Newman. I arrived at Blaupunkt as a factory worker. We had four supervisors, two male and two female. One of the male overseers, Schindler, appeared to behave correctly but was dishonest and dangerous. The other, a Dutchman by the name of Van Geest, spoke to us only as the work necessitated, and had anyone who did not please him delivered to the Gestapo. One of the women overseers was decent, but the other was arrogant and would have fit in well as a guard in a concentration camp. If you ever think your bosses are bad. Back to the book. My colleagues belonged to all classes of society. They ranged in age from 16 to 60 years old. We were not supposed to know what we were producing, but we discovered that we were assembling listening equipment for the Wehrmacht to be used in airplanes. After six weeks of training, I became a reel winder. We had to make 32 reels each day. Not right away on our first day, but each day we worked, we had to make more and more. At one point, when I had reached 28 reels a day, the Wehrmacht came back and returned many of the listening devices as unusable. The devices were disassembled, and they found that the problem lay with the reels. From the control numbers, it was determined who had made the defective reels, and the four workers identified as responsible were sent to the Gestapo. There they received a warning and were told that if this happened again, they would be sent to a concentration camp. Since these were not the best workers, since these were the best workers, I became very anxious and didn't want to do this kind of work. I no longer even tried to finish 32 reels and insisted that I could not carry such a workload. Because of this, I was transferred to another section. The work here did not entail such responsibility and I could fill my quota. Men and women worked together here in the same hall. I sat in a corner among only academics. They were very nice people, and although we were all very unhappy, we often joked with one another. As soon as the overseers turned their backs, we ignored the rules against talking. As I had already mentioned, Van Geest sent many women to the Gestapo. Among the older women... We had some unfortunate people, sick and suffering, and therefore not exactly skilled. They had to clean toilets and perform other unpleasant tasks. If he didn't like them, he had them taken away. He claimed that one of the other women had made advances towards him, and although he was extremely handsome, none of us believed it. She disappeared. We could not ask her about it. There was also a homosexual woman. For months, Van Geese didn't know about her. But as soon as he found out, she too disappeared. 
So that's what it was like at the factory where silly Samuel, Marion's mother, was forced to labor while enduring the same horrendous taxes on her already meager pay. Back to the book. On Saturday, February 27, 1943, Ernst, Silly, and Marion were arrested. The arrest occurred as part of a larger roundup, which the Reich's main security office had ordered to be carried out abruptly at the beginning of the workday. The roundup was aimed at the armaments Jews and their families. Later it became known as the Factory Action. Josef Goebbels, the Gauleiter, Nazi Party district leader of Berlin, had written in mid-February that by February 28th, by the February 28th deadline, the Berlin Jews should be round would be rounded up into camps and then deported in batches of 2,000 per day. Two days later, the Reich Main Security Office issued guidelines for the technical realization of Goebbels' order, not only for Berlin, but for the entire Reich. On the morning of February 27, Berlin police stations were ordered to initiate their part in the large-scale action. The Jews in the factories, as well as the Jews in the street, easily recognizable because of their star-shaped badges, were to be picked up and delivered to designated assembly points. The Jewish community building on Gross Hamburger Strasse and Klau Ballroom and a pair of barracks. Of the 11,000 potential victims, 7,000 were seized. And again... Gotts Alley uses the words of Camilla Newman when he can't find the words of Silly Samuel. Back to the book, the blau-punked worker Camilla Newman, whose husband Ludwig was arrested, removed her star and inquired about him in front of the assembly point at Gross Hamburger Strasse. She wrote in her memoir, What I gleaned in bits and pieces from various people was shocking. Since their arrest, the Jews received no food. It was simply no longer possible for the Jewish community to provide for those thousands of people, and for those rounded up to receive even the smallest things. The transports were to begin that evening. Ooh, excuse me. The transports were to begin that evening, on March 1st leaving one after another. Married couples never saw each other again because they had worked in different factories. Parents never saw their children again. Children were taken from their homes and deported in separate transports. It was all so shattering, and the terrible winter cold made it even worse. Back to the book. Ernst and Silly Samuel were taken to different collection points, and so did not see each other again after they were arrested. Silly was deported to Auschwitz on March 1st in the 31st Jewish transport from Berlin. Ernst followed two days later in transport 33. Both of them were required to fill out lengthy property declarations at the time of their arrests demanding information such as whether any relatives had immigrated and where they had gone. Silly Samuel wrote, Mother, three brothers, one of them to USA. Under the heading Liquid Assets, Ernst Samuel wrote, Approx, two marks. Because the arrest happened on a Saturday morning, he also specified the expected amount of his next paycheck, approximately 50 marks gross. For total amount of current assets, he wrote, approx 52 marks. Horribly underpaid, horribly exploited, the Samuel family was living paycheck to paycheck. And here is where some of these primary source documents really... 
underline the point of this book. On the left-hand page, there's the scan of the original document with the words written by the hand of Ernst Samuel on his deportation form. And then to the right is a, a translation so non-German speakers can see. There's also the property declaration form, which is pitiful because Ernst Samuel had no property at this time. They were so poor. There's just lines, dashes through the places to list where they had property. Back to the book. For Mary and Samuel, these must have been dreadful days and nights. She was completely alone, without any relatives. Her name was on the list for Transport 32, which left for Auschwitz on March the 2nd, but it was crossed out and placed instead on the list for the transport leaving the day after that. On March 1st, after almost three full days of separation from her family, Marion was transferred from the Gross Hamburger Strasse building to the collection point where her father was being held. Because Ernst Samuel filled out Marion's property declaration form, we know that they were reunited at this collection point and that she did not make her final trip alone. And that is incredible. That God Sally. It's, it's, it's written nowhere. Nowhere specifically for God's Alley to see, okay, Marion was reunited with her father, and she didn't make that final trip on her own. He, he could tell by looking at the primary source documents, doing the hard historical research with the primary documents he found, her father had filled out her form. Therefore, they must have been reunited. And it's that kind of sleuth work, that detective work that makes this book and Gotts Alley's efforts so amazing. He goes on to talk about what happens to the Samuel's family's assets. And to cut things short, everything they had was confiscated. All of their possessions, meager as they were, assigned crude value. And God Sally, meticulous is the word I will use, and I use that word admiringly. God Sally says, one can find the listing for the man who had evaluated everything so puncti punctiliously. Wilhelm Vesper. And it has his address. So they sent in Wilhelm Vesper to mark down what everything in the Samuels apartment was worth. So then it could be redistributed to bombed out German families. Aryan families. Back to the book. Of the 1,886 people on the train that brought Marion Samuel and her father to Auschwitz, 200 women received prisoner numbers. 37,296 to 37,495. And 517 of the men received the numbers from 10, excuse me, from 105,571 to 106,087. In other words, the SS commando in charge, which was usually led by a physician, sent a total of 717 people to be worked to death and the other 1169 on their way to the gas chambers that selection process is actually detailed in the first episode of the modern military history podcast which has selections of Victor E. Frankel's Man's Search for Meaning Victor Frankel was a somewhat fit male and remembers clearly the lazy way in which the SS officer used his gloves to indicate right or left, life or death, and the callous nature in, way the, in which the guards separated families forever. Most women were sent immediately to the gas chambers, as were all children, 
especially young girls, who were seen as no use and would not last long enough being worked to death. Back to the book. In addition to the deportees from Berlin, March 4th, 1943, saw 1,000 men, women, and children from France arrive in Auschwitz. Of these, 881 were sent immediately to the gas chambers. Thus, on March 4th, 1943, more than 2,000 human beings were murdered in Auschwitz, all of them because they were Jews. Silly Samuel had arrived two days before on the 31st transport out of Berlin. In the case of that transport, 292 men and 385 women were selected for forced labor, while 1,161 were immediately murdered. It is possible that Silly Samuel survived for a short period. We know for certain that the selection commando chose Ernst Samuel for forced labor. A note died on May 4, 1943, is handwritten on his birth certificate in the registry at Uckermenda. The note adds that the date of his death was determined by the Arlson Special Bureau, Auschwitz Department. The German town of Bad Arlson is where the internal International Tracing Service of the Red Cross had been working since 1945 to clarify the fate of millions of people who were deported and murdered in the Ger under the German regime. Using tens of thousands of pages of deportation lists, card files, prisoner records, and documents from the camps. In the concentration camp system of annihilation through labor, Ernst Samuel survived for exactly 61 days. Marion Samuel, however, was only a child, and a female child at that. The SS would not have considered her in any way fit for labor. On the morning of March 4th, 1943, Marion Samuel was taken from her father and led to one of the Auschwitz-Birkenau two older gas chambers, Bunker 1 and Bunker 2, which had been installed in former farmhouses. And in parentheses, the modern gassing and crematoria complex, which today represents the very concept of Auschwitz, was only opened a short time later. End parentheses. Back to the book. According to the report of Camp Commandant Rudolf Haas, Groups designated for gassing were sent as soon as possible on the 1.5-mile walk from the station platform to the bunkers. Above all, Haas said, it was important that the entire process of arrival and disrobing be carried out as peacefully as possible. No screams, no outbursts. Nonetheless, panic often broke out. It was met with violence, blows, and shouts. Finally, with the rapid closing of the airtight bunker doors, the noise was stifled. The gassing process has been described by eyewitnesses, but I shall remain from quoting them here. Skipping ahead a little bit, there is little more to be said about Mary and Samuel's final days. As little as we know about her short life, marked as it was so early by state and societal violence, and then destroyed. The property declaration form for Marion Samuel that her father filled out has the word son jotted down in one corner by the official, with that word crossed out and replaced with daughter in the same handwriting. We know, therefore, that Marion must have had a somewhat boyish first impression and we can glean another bit of visual information from Emily Holz, who lived in Arnswalda until 1945. Frau Samuel was a very lovely woman, and her little daughter Marion had beautiful, large, brown eyes, she writes. In the end, the only person who can tell us something about what Marion felt is Hilma Kruger, the classmate who had spent a full year with Marion at the neighborhood public school in Berlin 
and who responded in 2003 to my appeal for information in the Berliner Zeitung. In the same letter where she first alerted me to the existence of a class photo, Hilmer Kruger, Kruger also described a conversation that took place in May 1938, just before Marion Samuel was required to leave that school. And these are the words, the recollections of Hilma Kruger, as Gotts Alley recorded in his interview with her. I knew Marion Samuel, and to this day, I cannot get her out of my mind. Again and again, when I read or hear something about the persecution of the Jews, I think about her. There is a reason why I cannot forget her. I used to walk with her to Frau Molman's class. She was a quiet, reserved girl with a dark page boy hairstyle and large almond eyes. I have only a vague memory of her face because time has erased her appearance for me. But the memory of her eyes remains, and I know that I thought she was pretty. I was living then at Copenhagen, Strasse 66, and one day, at around 6 p.m., my mother sent me to the pharmacy on the corner of Rheinauer and Glemstrasse to pick up some medicine. On the way there, I saw Marion waiting outside her house. Because she had not been in school for a few days, I asked about her absence, and she replied that she had been sick. She was waiting for her mother. On the way back from the pharmacy, I passed her house again and saw that she was still standing there. It must have been shortly before seven o'clock. We chatted about why her mother was so oddly late coming home. Suddenly, Marion began to cry and said that she was frightened. I was surprised, and then she said, People go into a tunnel in a mountain, and along the way there is a great hole and they fall in and disappear. I thought she was acting a little crazy and that this was a gruesome thing to say. After that evening on May 1938, Hilma Kruger did not see Marion Samuel again. Marion had told her that she was a Jew, but children forget quickly and Hilma herself went through several evacuations to the countryside during the war. It was only in 1945, her letter continues, now 14 years old and once again in Berlin, that I saw a documentary film on Auschwitz and the other concentration camps. Suddenly, with horror, that day with Marion and her words about the tunnel rose up in my memory. She had probably overheard adults talking about things she could not fully comprehend, and then played out what she had heard in her child's fantasy. What terror she must have felt. And again, the only documented words of Mary and Samuel I'll read again. People go into a tunnel in a mountain and along the way there is a great hole and they fall in and disappear and the the point of the title into the tunnel becomes apparent and although that's particularly powerful the words of Mary and Samuel remembered by a former classmate forever burned into her mind, although she has forgotten what Marion looked like besides her eyes. She'll always remember those words. I'm going to read a little bit of the preface to this book, written by Ruth Kluger, who is herself a victim of the Holocaust although a victim in a different sense than Mariel in that Marion in that she survived. And these are the words of Ruth Kluger. This is a weighty little book. 
as easy to read as it is difficult to forget. While the author is a prominent historian, his heroine is completely unknown, or was, until he set about rescuing her from obscurity. Marion Samuel, a German Jewish child, was an ordinary victim of the Nazis' extermination policy, one of the faceless millions who were murdered as a matter of routine. Those who survived the Holocaust are always anything but ordinary or typical. They, or since I am one of them, we, all owe our lives to some extraordinary circumstance, be it a twist of fate or a helping hand. Marion Samuel, by contrast, went to her inconspicuous death just as intended, according to the procedures laid down in monstrous yet bureaucratically unassuming files. Now God Sally has taken her forgotten name from a list, and with no more than that name he has pieced together the whole girl, her shape, her clothes, her face, her fears, her words, even finding old photographs that allow her to appear literally before our eyes. Skipping a little bit of head, there is of course another girl who immediately comes to mind. Another girl who died in a Nazi camp and whose life and death have been the subject of meticulous investigation. But Anne Frank was immortal even before the many books about her appeared, having left behind her world-famous diary. Marion Samuel, on the other hand, was a nobody. A blank page. Someone who for a small number of years had a fragile claim to human existence. And those are the words of fellow Holocaust victim and survivor Ruth Kluger in the preface of God Sally's Into the Tunnel. And those are all the selections I have for podcast number four from this book. But my conclusion although I promise it will be short, is this. What really came to me as I read God Sally's book again, it was originally prescribed to me in college in my uh, Judaic Studies-led Holocaust class. And it was one of the few college books I retained and kept and remembered. It's the incredible meticulous nature of the historian and in a way only a historian can brought to light the humanity of these people who are nothing but names on a page for most of us and as I've been reviewing this book getting ready for this podcast as I sit in my warm house in my comfortable clothes eating what I choose, seeing my parents when I wish, meeting with my friends, pursuing my projects, living my life. I can't help but I can't help but put myself there in the shoes of a scared young girl who had everything that I enjoy today taken from her in the most violent and horrendous way possible. Gassed to death. Never to see her mother or father again. And her father, who had his daughter torn from him, died 60 days later, worked to death. And while... Man's search for meaning documents Viktor Frankl, who lived through forced labor. One can only think of how a man like Ernst Samuel was broken, and his will to live shattered, watching his daughter led away among the hordes of those 2,000 other individuals murdered on that single day on March the 4th, 1943. And 1943 was the, the peak of the killing of the Holocaust because that's when 
the Nazi Germans had reached their their zenith. After 1943, it was nothing but retreats. It was nothing but increased pressure from a ever approaching Allied front line from all sides. And that strain on resources also shows in the numbers of humans killed. But this book makes you look at those numbers completely differently. And if this book resonate, resonated with you, as it did with me, to the point that I've read it multiple times despite its size, to the point that I've read, excuse me, learned not only about Marion Samuel's life, but how to be a better historian and a better human being, go ahead and buy it. I'm going to link it in the description. It's a small book. But it is a powerful book. And as as Ruth Kluger in the preface says, it's as easy to read as it is difficult to forget. I'm going to come back at you next week with podcast number five. I'll be bringing another book to the YouTube channel. As always, this has been Andy. This is the modern military history. Thank you. And I'll see you next time.